Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints. In this episode, I get a chance to talk with Chef John Bates from Interstellar Barbecue in Austin, Texas. Uh, we start off by talking about his branding. He's got some new branding. It's relatively new. It was created by uh, Brady Clark from Brisket Country. It's really cool stuff. If you haven't had a chance, I'll put a couple images really quick if you're watching the YouTube, but check out their uh, new branding. It looks awesome. And it makes sense. It's like this it's definitely in my wheelhouse and it made a lot of sense for uh, for chef this is really an interesting one and, and i've been intrigued and wanted to talk to him for a while and it, it took us a while to get this together uh, we talk about his journey from corpus christi he talks about great breakfast tacos there he gives a lot of information he he's been in the restaurant world since 17 since not 1917 but since he's been 17 years old and because of that he has worked at a bunch of different types of restaurants and learned a bunch of different cuisines and technique and he went to portland and worked in portland for a while and came back and worked in austin for six years while he came up with this concept for the sandwich shop and he goes into detail about how he got that sandwich shop open and how much work he had to do and how it's essentially a primer for not how not to open a re <laughs> restaurant. That, that, but it's interesting. It's, he's, he's dead honest about things, very straightforward. I think you're going to love it. If you're going to open a restaurant or want to open a restaurant, you're really going to love this. We talk about when Guy Fieri from Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives came and that process. And, and it's really interesting to hear how they got chosen and, and the different things that you had to go to, the different hoops you had to go through to get on the show and then what the show and the impact of the show and how they open a second location, second sandwich location, and then how they've turned that into a barbecue joint and all about the menu. And it's an incredible menu, and I've only heard incredible things. I haven't been yet, but it's just great. And we also talk about the nature of the barbecue business and the fact that everyone takes photos, just like, like I do, but photos and filming and, and, and that whole aspect of the barbecue business and what you have to understand once you jump into the barbecue business. Anyways, I'm rushing this through this because I really want you to get to the meat of the interview literally and i have two sponsors on board for the kevin's barbecue joints youtube and podcast they are treaty oak distilling out of dripping springs texas you can check them out at treatyoak.com or treaty oak on all social media and also aj's custom cookers they're available at ajscustomcookers.com you can see all their stuff there as well as aj's custom cookers on all the social media and if you're digging these please subscribe that way you don't miss out I'm doing two of these per week, if not more. If you just listen to the podcast, I have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Kevin's BBQ Joints. I'm on all the social media at Kevin's BBQ Joints. I have a website at Kevin's BBQ Joints, which is relaunching very, very soon with some really awesome stuff. So I think you're going to dig that. I'll let you know exactly when that does launch. But at the end, thanks for listening. I do appreciate it. Enjoy this. <music> Good afternoon, good evening. John, how are you? I'm good, man. How are you doing today, Kevin? Good, good. I'm glad we got finally got a chance to uh, talk. And I, I love your, first off, let's just say I love your logo. I love all the new branding that you guys have. Yeah, it, it's been really good. We're working with uh, Brady Clark over at Brisket Country. is his uh, Instagram profile, and uh, he does amazing work. And we've known him for a while now, so it was great to connect with him and actually do a project. Yeah, he's so talented. And, and the stickers that we traded when I got the stickers, I showed so many people and it's just i love how it looks like uh like nasa patches and yeah well you know i i told him that i wanted to have fun with the with the logo and with the with the brand when we decided to throw this all together and he was all for it so he, I, in retrospect i think i couldn't have picked a better person to work with so no it definitely feels like it gelled perfectly well let's let's go back to back to be beyond noble let's go to uh to where you grew up. Where did you grow up? Uh, I'm originally from South Texas. Okay. Uh, a, a city called Corpus Christi on the coast of, mm -hmm. uh, of Texas. Was born and raised down there and uh, yeah, moved around a bit, but that's where I spent most of my time. What was it like that? Like, is it, and do you go back there? Cause I've, I've always wondered what it, if it would be a place to visit now. Um, Corpus is a cool town. I mean, it's a beach town. It's pretty laid back. You know, growing up there, I definitely wanted to leave as soon as possible. Uh, but yeah. now that we've been away for a while, we enjoy going back to the beach, um, seeing my folks and my sister. They all still love down there. So it's nice to go home and visit. And there's some food stuff down there that I can't get really anywhere else. So when I go back home, I'm always jonesing for And what is that? Grew up with. Uh, specifically, the tacos down there, the breakfast tacos are phenomenal. Just made with 
every like legit taqueria down there makes all their tortillas from scratch and there's there's always like some tortilla wizard back there who's making them um and just how they cook it and their approach to it is just it just tastes completely different than anything i've had in austin or even in that's, San Antonio. that's an interesting tip too for people that if they are yeah. visiting they should search that out that would be something they should yeah you should definitely have breakfast tacos there you should try to find some barbacoa that's kind of what they specialize in down there. And there's just a lot of really solid tex Mex too. Is it so. because of its proximity to Mexico or closer proximity? Yeah, yeah we're like three hours from uh, the border. So we're definitely like in the heart of South Texas. So you're going to see a ton of Tex-Mex influence and in everything there. Um, you know, and culturally, like population wise, I mean, I would say it's probably – predominantly hispanic in south texas so you see that in the food and you see that in in the culture were you eating barbecue or even central texas style barbecue back then yeah yeah i mean so i have family all throughout texas uh my my dad's family's been in texas for like 200 years so um we were like longtime residents of the state but i grew up with like central style texas barbecue that my uncle would cook okay uh but home in 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 south texas and corpus um it was more stuff like cooked over mesquite, you know, more uh, fajitas and lingua and barbacoa and the things that was common at backyard parties mm. at home. Um, so a little bit of both, to be honest with you. There wasn't a restaurant serving Central Texas style in that area, was there? No. And I, there, I think there might be, might be a few places that popped up, but there's never really been like a, a super legit um, solid like barbecue option in Corpus. I mean, I think some places may have opened up since I m- moved away. I've been gone for about 10 years now. Mm-hmm. But uh, when I was growing up there, I mean, it was just like Bill Miller's and those kinds of places. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. That's more of the chains, which a lot of people are yeah. exposed to. Yeah, I mean, there's other the chain restaurants. I mean, they are what they are. Mm-hmm. They serve a purpose, but they're not, you know, I wouldn't think of them as craftsmen with their food. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're more about volume yeah and a lot of those spaces too the the people that are working there aren't necessarily all passionate about barbecue it's more of like serving food yeah. it's like it's a restaurant yeah. and a restaurant job it's a job and a job for most of them so. yeah yeah because i've talked to people too that have worked in a place that's a chain ish and there's maybe one person that's excited the other people are just let's just get it out <laughs> and everybody looks at that one person and excited like he's the weirdo in the bunch yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's gonna get fired right, soon. he's gonna get out of here <laughs> well so then how did you make this journey to food how did you go to culinary school um so i went to culinary school but that was well after i'd started working in restaurants i actually started in restaurants when i was 17 wow. as a dishwasher there in, in, in corpus kind of grew up in them uh, worked a variety of different positions, usually back of the house. I've always been more of a kitchen guy, okay. although I've done some front of the house stuff. But yeah, it was just kind of all I've ever done. I've always been in restaurants. And when I decided to get serious about it, after I had my first child, I decided to go to culinary school there in Corpus and start to learn more about like the business side and, and how to act like a professional in a restaurant as opposed to just being an employee. Were you thinking about maybe restaurant management or were you thinking about opening a restaurant? Um, both. Like at that point in time, I kind of knew that I was going to be in restaurants for the, for the long haul. Mm-hmm. So um, I decided to, to major in culinary arts and then also in restaurant management because they offered a, a dual bachelor's degree in those uh, fields. How did you make your way up to Austin? Was that a thing that you and your wife did? or? Yeah, so we moved around a little bit. Um, we spent most of our time in portland oregon uh once we left we spent about four years there and when we were starting to look at like the long term like i wanted i knew i wanted to open up a restaurant but i also wanted to be closer to my family my wife's family i wanted my kids to be closer to their relatives and there just didn't seem like a good way to like keep close with family when we're in the pacific northwest and everybody else is based in texas and on a cook's wage, I just couldn't really see myself traveling a whole lot. So when we decided to make like a long term, like, hey, where are we going to be? We decided to go back to Texas. And Austin is my favorite city in Texas. So Did going to Portland inspire you in some way or a restaurant you worked at to do the sandwich thing? It's funny. It was, it was, it was a long journey to opening up the sandwich shop. You know, when I was in Portland, my long term goal was to learn as much about food as possible. And the Northwest is a hotbed for 
uh, creative food. They've got great ingredients. Such um, great options. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, back then they were supporting farmers markets and, and they were thriving before they were ever really cool in most cities. Yeah. So it was a really great food destination. And back then I always thought I was going to open up some kind of like high end, like fine dining, fancy <laughs> kind of restaurant. Well, that didn't come to fruition, but, uh, <laughs> That was the goal back in Portland. Did you work at any higher end places there? I actually worked at a Cuban Creole restaurant there, huh. which is kind of funny. I never, I, I thought I was going to end up in a fine dining restaurant out there, but um, I landed in this Cuban joint. It was a lot of fun because they were cooking with ingredients that I hadn't been exposed to. Yeah, that's uh, nice. They were doing like nose to tell, you know, like whole animal cookery because that's what Cuban food is based on before I'd ever seen other chefs really doing it. So it was from a cooking standpoint, a really fun place to cook at, but it was very casual. You know, it wasn't like a high end restaurant. It was quick. It was a quick kind of service restaurant with a low price point, but um, it was a really well loved restaurant. So did you like working in Oregon? Um, I did. The weather's rad for a cook. It's a hell of a lot cooler. Yeah, yeah no, I, I love it up there. The whole family as a whole, just we're not really like, we're not really like Portland, Portlandites. Like we don't really thrive in the rain. Mm -hmm. So that was the only other drawback. It's just weather wise. It was, it's tough going from somewhere where it's sunny, like 360 <laughs> days a year to somewhere where it rains almost as much as that's true. Did, did Rodney Muirhead have his restaurant then pot in his pit? Was uh, that I don't think so. No, yeah. I left, I left Portland in 2005. So it's been, a it bit. might've been just when he was beginning or something or starting. Yeah. It's been like crossing over at that point in time. So then when you came back, did you go directly to Austin? Yeah, we, we chose Austin and decided to settle back down there. And did you p team up with someone to do a restaurant or did you work at a restaurant first and then? No, when I landed in Austin, I wanted to kind of get a lay of the land and make some, some connections, mm -hmm. uh, build my networking here in Austin. So I spent uh, a couple years at a kind of high-end farm-to-table American restaurant mm -hmm. and then transitioned to be the chef at an Italian place. Huh. So I about six years working before I decided to launch our sandwich shop and that was closer to 2010 when I decided to do that what was that like and also too like it seems like you have a, a long history of like not seems like you do have a long history of restaurants I don't not everyone that's in the barbecue business right now is has had yeah. the pedigree that you have because it seems like yeah you definitely you've you've gone through almost like so many different styles too pedigree or curse I don't know what it is it's one yeah, of the yeah. other <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's all I've ever done. I mean, I love hospitality. I love food service. I, I, I like to think of restaurants as a career and a, and a profession, mm -hmm. not something – Man, I kind of fell into it to start with, but I ultimately embraced it as, like, my calling. So, And it is kind of almost like in Europe, people – there's waiters that are – that's their career. There's people that yeah. it seems like in different places that it doesn't – it's not always – it's usually a transitionary thing for a lot of people in the United States. Not everyone yeah. wants to do it, which is, I, I think it's a career. I know I know lots of people that have worked forever in restaurants. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be a really cool thing. I mean, you know, I grew into the restaurant scene in the business when, you know, being a chef became cool all of a sudden. And like, <laughs> yeah, that's like the moment, yeah. Supposedly made lots of money and they were rock stars. And, you know, the other 99.9% .9 of cooks and chefs are just like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's, it's kind of a middle class job where you, you try to make a living and, mm -hmm. If you love it, it's great. It's really rewarding, um, but you have to love it, or otherwise, it's just it's it's a tough racket. How did Noble Sandwich Company? How did that come about? And and were you planning on? Obviously, you're planning on doing a sandwich place. Is that? Did you think that that was a void in the Austin market at the time? Yeah, uh, honestly, I was looking to transition away from nighttime based restaurants. Mm -hmm. My amazing family has supported me for a really long time, working that night shift and kind of being away all the time. But it was really starting to wear thin for everybody uh, back around 2009. It's no, it's hard. It's really hard. And I'm, I'm super lucky. Uh, I have a great wife and amazing kids that have always supported me. And uh, they're much better than I deserve. Uh, they, they put up with all my shenanigans. But it was time for a change. So we were brainstorming about, like, how could I do something that I uh, respected and wanted to do but change like the direction I was going. So ultimately I thought it would be really rad to run a sandwich shop, a daytime based business, um, get to see my family more, maybe at some point get to have them work in the restaurant. Uh, so we decided to like kind of chase this dream of doing like a, 
kind of chef inspired sandwich shop. And there wasn't anything quite like that at the time in Austin. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of now doing, you know, more high end sandwiches. But oh, yeah. then at that point, it was kind of like a novel concept. Mm-hmm. Was that hard to get a loan for that and deal with that? Like, I, I, I like just for, for someone to hear what that journey is like, is it, was it difficult to get that started up? Not necessarily the loan, but just to get it started up and then what was the reaction once you opened? When it comes to the funding and the founding of the restaurant, I often tell people that we would be the case study on how not to open up a restaurant. Okay. They would be like, so here's how you do it. You raise money and you have a business plan and you and you do A, B, C, and D. Now here's what John and his partners did. You don't <laughs> want to do this. Um, because we had no funding um, really to say um, my parents and my partner's parents uh, gave us both about ten thousand wow. um, dollars. We found a rundown uh, Tex-Mex restaurant on the northwest side of Austin. Actually, my wife, my wife found it, and uh, we managed to convince them to let us buy the business uh, on payment. And then we spent the next uh, four months, literally, like I laid all the tile in the in the restaurant to read do the floors i redid all the painting we built the cabinetry me and my dad built the tables um we bought used chairs and uh, <laughs> shut them down and refinished them there was a lot of begging and pleading borrowing there might have been some trade and there could have been some theft involved i'm not sure how we got all of our equipment <laughs> but we managed to get enough stuff together to kind of cobble a restaurant together and it certainly wasn't what um, I would have liked to have had from day one, but it's what we could manage to scrape together. And when we literally had no money left and, uh, with, you know, we were looking at like, if we don't open up or we're never going to open up is when we, all right, well, we better do it now because if we don't, we may not make it to like October or November. Wow. So, that's yeah. cr- crazy. We're, we're, we're terrible. We're we're not how you do it. We did it the hard way. Did you have 10 sandwiches when you first opened? Uh, yeah, I think we had nine or 10. I can't remember what the exact count was, but it was all done from scratch. Like it, we would go to the grocery store every day and buy new ingredients because we didn't have enough money to buy ingredients for more than a day or two. <laughs> so we would just scrape together what we could, purchase the small amounts, and then we would literally like reprep everything daily because we just didn't have any like ability to have like inventory. Wow. That is nuts. And what was, were, did, how did people, did you just fr- friends and family, word of mouth? Is that how it got? Word of mouth. I mean, we got really lucky uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, back then, Instagram and Twitter wasn't really uh, a thing yet. Twitter, maybe a little bit, but Instagram, not at maybe all. Maybe Twitter, but I, what, I wasn't thinking of it as a, a tool for marketing the restaurant. It yeah. seemed like this thing where people would go and have, you know, really short conversations and, and things, but it didn't seem like a marketing pro- platform at the time. But yeah, I mean, fortunately for me, I had a pretty solid reputation in Austin as a chef at the fine dining restaurant I worked in. And then when I ran the Italian restaurant, I had built up a a decent reputation. So I was on the radar for like foodies a bit. And so people were kind of watching and wondering, like, why did this guy who was a chef at a farm and table restaurant and 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 a nice Italian restaurant decide to go open up a sandwich shop and go like run a subway or something. <laughs> yeah, there must so, be some a method to this, yes. Yeah, so it was just mere curiosity for some folks. So we had that kind of going for us, and that was really helpful. So when did uh, Mr. Guy, when did Guy, how did that, and, and they did they, they had to shut you down for like two or three days, right? Yeah, it's an, inter- it's an interesting process. I'm still not entirely sure how we ended up on their radar. I'm presuming that, I mean, our early guests were like super passionate about the restaurant. They kind of felt... A sense of ownership, I would say, mm-hmm. because they knew that we were small, they knew we were broke, they knew that we were trying really hard, we were there every day. So, like, I was like the only front of the house employee for like the first two years. Every order that went through that restaurant, and when I wasn't doing that, I was in the kitchen prepping or making bread or curing meats. Um, so, they knew how hard we were working. So, our early guests were like, they loved us and they were super supportive. And I think they actually reached out to the show and said, hey, you should check out this restaurant. That's probably how it happened. Yeah, it was really cool. But yeah, it was a bit of a challenge. I mean, it was kind of scary for us because they ask you, the ask is like, you know, you go through this whole process and they spend like 20 or 30 hours like on phone interviews, providing recipes. I mean, to the minute details like salt, 
how do you put the salt in? Which hand do you use? Does it go in a mixing bowl? I mean, uh, very uh, like <laughs> stuff, really tedious. And they finally said, all right, well, we want you. But in order for us to work with you, you got to close for three days. And by the way, it's going to be on like a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, which are like the busiest days of the week for you. So it was really scary. I was like, well, I don't know if we can even afford to close down mm-hmm. for three days. Um, but we took the chance, and it worked out pretty well. Wow, that's so crazy! And and th- and what was the reaction from that? Was that pretty massive? Oh, it was nuts. Um, so they came in, and guy, you know, I was a little wasn't really sure what to expect of him, because he was super famous by then. Lots of restaurants, TV shows. He didn't have to roll in and like be friendly at all. He could have just been all Hollywood and did what he was supposed to do in Jet. But he was actually really helpful, and you know, he spent you know, a good hour, like, talking to us about, like, hey, here's what to expect, here's what she should do, here's some advice, you know, based on what I've seen other restaurants do, and he said, you're going to be busy, like, immediately, and and I took it all pretty much to heart, but I didn't really think we were going to be busy immediately, I figured (laughs) it would be, like, a couple of days or a week before we'd start to see people kind of trickling in, and the show aired, and literally the next day, we had a line out the door and down the breezeway. Uh, we just got destroyed. Isn't that amazing, the power of television and the power of Guy? And also, he obviously, like, for all the clowning that people do on him, he yeah. is uh, he is passionate about small business and about small restaurants. And he... Oh, he absolutely is. I mean, it, uh, he's got a bad rap, like, in the chef world. Like, mm-hmm. people like to on him. But he made a point of telling us, he said, whatever you get from this show, run with it if you see some kind of catchphrase that you want to put on a shirt or you want to use something you see from the show he says it's all yours to use so nice take it and make the most of it like take this opportunity and i want you guys to succeed and he was very genuine about it i never heard from um you know from from guys team or from the food network any complaint about us trying to use anything and uh i think he's really genuine i mean Mm -hmm. as rap as he gets um you know, I, I enjoyed working with him, and he's done a lot for barbecue too. And that's the uh, and that's something that I've 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 often wanted to talk to him because I just just talked to him about the bar, the barbecue specific part because I feel like he has he has done a lot. And I know restaurants that have done like tripled quadrupled their business and had to expand the restaurant because of... yeah, I mean we had the most amazing and like most god awful summer of my life that summer <laughs> because it was like we were working so hard and there was so much opportunity and it, we were just getting killed every day but we were growing at such an amazing rate uh it was like the most amazing and horrible time it all wrapped it up at once that's interesting uh, it really set us up for like the next three or four years of growth that we had how did the transition because did you before you went into barbecue i i forget the timeline did you open a second location before the barbecue came up yeah so what we did is we got into the catering game um we had customers and friends of the restaurant like asking us to do uh, special events for them, anniversaries, you know, like 50th anniversaries, weddings and stuff. So we we decided to get into catering, and that's been really cool. We've really enjoyed that's that. That's actually a smart segment. It's a smart segment to get into, but it also makes sense with what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And then we, we opened up a second restaurant, and we really focused on growth up until a couple of years ago as we were trying to see if we could take that that concept and turn it into maybe more than one location mm-hmm. with the idea that we could possibly do like all scratch chef driven, you know, quick service quality like sandwiches, but in multiple locations was the goal. Did the barbecue come because that was just something you were passionate about? Well, I love barbecue uh, as a native Texan. I feel like the birthright, I'm an expert on barbecue yes, and, you are. and have a, an innate talent for barbecue. But we were kind of ready for a change. You know, I love sandwiches it's probably more than the average person. But after making, you know, basically the same menu for nine years, mm-hmm. uh, we wanted to do something different. I really wanted to do something different. That makes different. complete sense. I've always wanted to have different types of restaurants. Like I always thought, like if I got lucky enough and worked hard enough and worked with the right people that I might have a restaurant group that might have different styles of mm-hmm. restaurants. So it seemed like a good opportunity to take the one of the sandwich shop locations and maybe flip it at a very low cost because it's super expensive to open up a restaurant yeah. anywhere, but especially in Austin. Um, for a real low cost, we could like take this space and, and do something new and 
you know, have fun again and, and try something out. And did you instantly call it Interstellar or was it no? And, and was it, am I thinking, I'm, maybe I'm thinking, was it ever Noble Pig? Was it ever, or is it always Noble Sandwich Gun? So our original restaurant we opened up was called Noble Pig. Yeah. Okay. Um, pretty much shop. Uh, about three years in, when we decided to expand to a second location, we changed the name to Noble Sandwich Co. Okay, I'm not going crazy. Okay. Yeah, no, you, 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 you're right. And a lot of people still remember us as Noble Pig, okay. um, but we decided to make that change. Uh, with the sandwich shop, you know, turning into the barbecue place, um, I really wanted to have fun with the name and not have like a very standard issue like barbecue name restaurant like smoke whatever or smoky this or you know i just didn't want for it to be the name to be um uh, a kind of a standard issue what you would expect of a barbecue yeah. restaurant you could have had like bates barbecue and then had like the bates motel and, and it made it all scary oh, john's or <laughs> you know this or that you know it just i didn't want to with with this opportunity of change i didn't want for it to be um standard issue i just wanted to have have the option of having more fun and that's been really nice because i think it allows us to stand out a little bit in what's a very competitive and very uh one would say saturated barbecue market in austin and central texas in particular but our name stands out as you know if you're gonna if you're gonna be in austin and you're gonna want to be successful and have people find you you know you you got to you got to try to fire in a lot of different directions. So you can't just have good food. You got to have a good story and a fun name, and you got to be engaging with people. Mm-hmm. Um, tough market for all restaurants, not just barbecue. So we, that was the first step. Was the name? And is it is it is it weird too the fact that now people everyone films everything nowadays and takes pictures of every single? Yeah, I'm, I'm like cutting brisket, and they're like filming me the whole time, and yeah. it's really awkward. I mean, yeah. I enjoy it because they share it, and it, that's part of like getting the story out but yeah every everything's filmed everything's yeah. take a picture of everything um everybody is a critic everybody's guys everybody has a platform mm-hmm. to, to tell their story so um engaging with people and thinking about how that food's gonna look when it hits the tray yeah. is now part of like the game like uh-huh. when i'm talking to my cutting it's like all right so just remember <laughs> for a good chance that dude's gonna be taking a picture of that tray so we want it to look nice we want it to look <laughs> i know it's uh, not... built specific you know, to, to be photo worthy as opposed to just kind of throwing it all in the tray, yeah. which would have been fine 10 years ago, but now everybody takes a picture. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it is amazing too, like at an Italian restaurant or anything else, people might take photos of the food after it's brought out, but no one's taking pictures of the guy boiling the noodles and put it, and plating it. And it's it, uh, it, yeah. it is like, it's something too. Like I kept thinking, like recently I was thinking people need to think about when they get into the barbecue game if they want to be filmed all the time and that, that's you know yeah if you're front and center you have to be comfortable with that yeah, yeah no you totally do and and they, they, people want to see everything with barbecue they want to see the pit uh they they want to you know, uh, we're, we're having people ask us now left and right can we come like learn how to make sausages with you can we come you know spend a day working with you so we can understand how to, how to do this and so yeah that's like you know, how do I work that in as part of like, like growing the mm-hmm. restaurant and growing the narrative? You know. Yeah, yeah. No, that's and then doing like having some guy from California want to interview you via Skype. Like that's everything's just wacky. The world's wacky. Right? I mean, barbecue is very. It's a very different animal. Like I love that and community in the restaurant world because like I didn't. I, you know, people people talk a lot about like. The, the family atmosphere of barbecue and, and, and the camaraderie and, uh, you know, a jaded restaurateur or a jaded chef can look at that and say, yeah, that's whatever. That's, mm-hmm. you know, that's a bunch of BS or just everybody's like fronting. Um, because I never really experienced that in other parts of the restaurant industry, but with barbecue in particular, uh, uh, customers and fans of barbecue, their passion is like legit. Mm-hmm. They're really into it. And uh, I have found a really like friendly community of other like guys making barbecue that I wasn't quite expecting to be as genuine as it has been. Yeah, from the outside, perhaps it looks like it might not be real, but it is real. And it's 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 like 95 percent of the people out there want to share their success with everyone else. Like it's something that yeah, and the whole the whole barbecue scene is bigger than the restaurant itself. Mm-hmm. 
you know, guys like you and people that just have a passion for, for the craft. Um, it's, it's, it's much bigger than just like coming in and making like a plate of food and serving it to somebody. There's a, there's this whole community and layers of it that mm-hmm. all kind of work together. And it's just, I guess it's because it's, maybe it's just more like a, a legit form of American food. It's there's, I, I don't feel like there's a lot of like real legit types of American mm-hmm. cuisine. And I definitely think barbecue is one of the few that you can point to, especially here in Central Texas, and say that's that's real American food that mm-hmm. that has background and history and community, and and it means more than just like having a, a picture of a plate in a trendy restaurant. And it's not just something where you're investing in a franchise or you're borrowing a concept. This is something that you're like. This is your story, and that's why I like to share people's stories because I feel like. You, your story is your barbecue place too. Like it's all meshed into sure. one. It's all interwoven. Let's talk about your menu. So people, I want people to know more about you. So you're open, is it Wednesday through Sunday? Yeah, right now we're Wednesday through th- Sunday. We open up at 11 a.m. and we run until we, you know, run out of food. Or, or if we get to the part of the day where the barbecue is starting to lose its luster and it's not as fresh and pristine as we want it to be. So we're typically closed most days between three and five. Okay. Um, we do our best to to project our numbers we want to stay open and as close to five as possible most days and then call it and start over again i would say the menu our goal with the menu is to honor like classic texas barbecue like with our brisket and a couple of the other items but very intentionally we're trying to have more fun with the rest of the menu and try to get a little beyond like the classic like texas trinity of like brisket with salt and pepper and you know, ribs that are just smoked and the standard issue, like Central Texas style sausage. Um, we definitely want to add like uh, our touch and our perspective on the rest of the menu and make it approachable, but um, make it fun and, and a little unique to us as opposed to like trying to do the same thing that everybody else is doing. What are the unique things that you're, the twist that you're adding? Well, I mean, you know, one of the things that I think like this a real starting point for us was a very, a deliberate decision to make sure that all parts of the menu matter as much as as the other parts. So, like for instance, you know, obviously the brisket is is the star, and you've got to make sure it's solid. Yeah. But we we put as much work and effort into our sides. Like, you know, we do a scallop potato dish that's layers of rusted potatoes with uh, cream and garlic and salt and pepper and everything that makes a potato awesome. And instead of baking it in a conventional oven, we cook it in our smoker. So uh. I think that's a great example of like doing a unique dish to us that's not like crazy. It's not like something weird, but it, it, it does speak of us and our location. And it's comfort food that no one else is really serving at barbecue places. It's like the most comfort of comfort food. That's I mean, just it sick. doesn't get any better than, than potatoes, you know? Yeah. The other thing that we really focus on on the sides is like, it just we have a, I would like to think like a, a cook's perspective on things. Like we mix our slaw to order with a jalapeno vinaigrette. Uh, instead of making it in big batches and letting it get kind of soft and sit around and pre-portioned, we're, we're, we're making it and, and, and seasoning that slaw to order. That's awesome. We do a tomato salad that, you know, it's a pretty standard issue to do tomato and cucumber in barbecue restaurants around here. So I took stuff that I learned at the Italian place and the Cuban place and made a tomato and zucchini salad huh. that eats kind of like a tomato cucumber, but has a very like different perspective and a different flavor profile. So that is... You know, that kind of focus on the size is one of the, the things that we thought would help us stand out in a market where there's a lot of really good brisket. And your wife is vegetarian, uh, right? Uh, yes. Okay. I learned a lot <laughs> from being married to a vegetarian. <laughs> I grew up in a home where everything was like meat and potatoes and wild game and fish. And like the craziest we got with vegetables was canned green beans <laughs> and the occasional iceberg salad with like no dressing. So when I married my wife, I was like, she helped me like, be introduced to a whole new style of cooking because I had to make her basically her own meal every night, you know, and yeah. I couldn't just like put a steak that wasn't going to cut it. And what's great too is going to your restaurant, if you bring someone, be it a spouse or a friend or whomever, that is a vegetarian, they have options. They have a full experience, and that's yeah. important to me. I want everybody who comes to the restaurant, although we may not have a ton of options for them, to have at least some solid options. I mean, 
you'll just do more business if you can get the guy who has a vegetarian girlfriend to come in along with the couples that are both totally in. I've been there too many, too many times. <laughs> Other things that I think it's important, like with our menu too, it's, you know, as much as we love the sides, you know, we try to approach uh, with, with the, the, the meat side of things. We try to have fun with it. Um, you know, we do a lot of specials. Uh, we've done things from, you know, smoked oxtail done with like a curried barbecue sauce. Oh. We have done, uh, you know, several different variations on ribs. We play around with like baby backs and St. Louis and, and try to introduce different flavors. Which, um, always experimenting with like different types of sausages and uh, flavor profiles. We've done Chinese flavored sausages. We've done, oh, wow. you know, I, I've been working on other conceptual things with sausages. We do a Frito pie one. I've heard great things. I've heard great things about everything, but people love the sausage. We work hard on that. I mean, and I, I was really big into charcuterie and meat curing prior as a chef. So uh, the craft of like making a quality sausage um, is something I really get excited about. Mm -hmm. So uh, we focus on it a lot. And that's great. And that's something too that like makes me so mad living in Los Angeles because that's not something that people focus on, especially barbecue restaurants. A lot of them buy pre-packaged pre, pre things yeah. because just because it's not, it's not ingrained here. It's not something that, and, and sausage is a big part of Texas barbecue. It's huge. And, and the other part of it too, it's like, I think as it, as like that scene grows there, you'll see that kind of next level up oh, for sure. of guys who perfect their craft of like doing you know brisket and maybe ribs and a few other things as they open up full service restaurants and have all this trim and waste that they have to do something with. They'll start thinking about well, we really should make a sausage that's part of the cuisine. It's a standard uh, of the food. Uh, that'll that'll come as restaurants become, you know, bigger and better and more serious. No, yeah, there, no, there's a lot of, there's people, not a lot, but there's like Moose Craft Barbecue, Heritage, which is in Orange County, they're making their own slab, Bert, he's starting to make his own sausage, he, they're not selling it yet, but yeah, you'll, they, we'll, we will see that, but it, it's something that, like, even if you go to HEB, you can get sausage that's pre-packed that's from a, a reputable company and it's... It's funny, you, you can go to Bucky's, a uh, freaking gas station here in Texas and get pretty decent barbecue that's funny you know? yeah i know that's awesome. true too yeah yeah it's wild it's just you know it's just different so. yeah it's different so what do you see so do you do you foresee it do you still have the other the other second sandwich place still open so right now we're kind of in a transition phase with the with the sandwich shop we actually have downsized it back into a trailer okay. or into a trailer and uh we will be relaunching it in a smaller space in a new location uh in february Okay. Uh, long term, we'd like to get that restaurant back into another like brick and mortar location, but we're going to move it to the outskirts of Austin, into the burbs, where cost of doing business is just a lot easier, and uh, you know you can get into a space and and actually be able to thrive. Because it's you know Austin is such a hot market for real estate, oh, yeah. and the taxes up every year. It's just it's tough to be a restaurateur in a rental situation because you just can't ever keep up with. No. With the numbers coming up every year. Is it, will it still be Noble Sandwich or will it be Interstellar Sandwich? <laughs> no, no, we're going to keep it as Noble. Um, uh, there's a lot of work and love in that concept and in that brand. Uh, we don't want to just like scrap it, but we need to uh, we need to find a, a more appropriate home for it. Do you guys uh, sell sandwiches at your location? Yeah, we do two sandwiches that are kind of, you know, we chose the items, a, a uh, it more we conceived it you know so we do two of them one is called the gangster in love and it's our uh our jalapeno popper sausage with uh ranch style beans and cheese and pickled onions and fritos crushed on it so it's kind of like a chili cheese sandwich and the other one is kind of our variation of a, a, a standard that you see everywhere uh, we call it the maurice and it's got our homemade kielbasa on there with chopped brisket and pickles and onions and slaw it's our version of that kind of like two meat barbecue sandwich. Okay. And of course, we let people just order like single meat things too. It's pretty common for people to roll in and want a sausage wrap or, or just a chopped beef sandwich or a sliced brisket sandwich. So we offer those as well. Are you making your own bread? Because you had mentioned that before. Is that? Uh, we did with Noble, but for the barbecue concept, um, I'm not. I just don't see the. No, after a running a sandwich shop making bread for nine years, I don't see <laughs> the value transition in a barbecue place no, making I bread. Can't. I mean, 
it, I would respect the hell out of somebody for doing it, but I just don't see the value in it. I've heard of some people wanting to do that, but I feel like eventually they'll stop. I think that's not something though. I mean, I was, I did it for nine years at the sandwich shop. So if you're crazy enough and dedicated enough, it'll happen. And somebody probably will, but, um, it's just, it's a giveaway, you know? So unless you're going to charge for the bread, it's difficult to justify the labor to make it. True. That's a good, that's a great point. It ain't like just throwing it in the smoker or, or, you know, or, you know, popping it into the oven. I mean, it, it, to make bread from scratch in volume requires a lot of equipment and people who know what they're doing and a lot of space. Uh, it becomes a bigger animal than you think when you're making like six loaves a day, you know, in the little oven. Yeah. And then you got to thinking about, well, how do I make 40 loaves a day? That's that transition. is uh, <laughs> that's insane. That's, actually. I've been there and done that. I, uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> so anybody listen to this, that might be a good tip. And then, <laughs> and then direct message you for tips on where to get the bread. Your local grocery store. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That'd be easy, easy enough. What's your location like? There's seating inside and outside? Yeah, we have indoor and outdoor seating. We took the old space and changed it up a little bit and made it uh, flow for the barbecue concept and change the interior touch and then we have outdoor seating as well patio that it's nice in the summertime yeah yeah because i think i most of the stuff i've seen is from outdoors so a lot of people like to sit outside yeah the, the lighting is nice outside you can get better pictures that way but because <laughs> that's the most better important. environment than taking a photo so most of my pictures when i'm doing my work okay, on social media I, I take it all outside because it just looks better are you having fun i am i love it i mean uh, it's a lot of work, but I mean, restaurants always are like, you don't, if you don't get into restaurants, I don't think you're going to work really hard. You're probably going to be really surprised. So the amount of work hasn't really changed so much, but it, it's been nice to do something I'm really passionate about. And, uh, it's been really well received. That always helps. Like so mm-hmm. it's a lot easier to come into work and have a smile on your face when, you know, people are excited about what you're doing, but yeah, I've been having fun. It's been good. Are people, do you say someone's coming on a th- Thursday, would they expect a line early in the morning or and then do you get through the line pretty quick? Well, so we, we've managed to build a, a pretty good reputation for the restaurant and create a pretty good buzz. We're not so busy that every day you have to worry about a line mm-hmm. necessarily. There are some days when we open up, we have people outside waiting and we get a line immediately and we stay pretty busy. There are other days when it's a little more laid back and people kind of show up later. Um, so we're not a real, I wouldn't say we're a real heavily like line driven restaurant. I think people have realized that they can show up basically at an opening or, or even a little bit after and still have a great meal because we've worked hard to make sure we have enough product on And make sure you can get all the items. So that's, that's nice to know. I want people to listen if they say they're coming in and they fly in and then they, they're, they're at one, they can come over and possibly get most, most of the meats. Yeah. I think if you make it to the restaurant you know, by 2, 2.30 most days, which is kind of the end of most lunch rushes, you're still going to have a pretty solid selection. And then lastly, dessert. Do you, have, you guys have desserts? So uh, not only am I a dishwasher, meat cutter, <laughs> fire tender, CPA, social media manager, I'm also a amateur pastry chef. All right. So I, I make the desserts. And um, on the desserts, we try to have, again, we try to do things that are approachable, but are kind of unique to us. So we don't really do banana pudding, but we make a really rad banana tart um, with, you know, uh, banana pudding filling into the tart topped off with wafers and whipped cream. And then we hit it with dulce de leche, you know, uh, caramel, caramelized milk. Um, We make rice pudding in a variety of different flavors. Um, And then I'm starting to toy around with doing uh, some cakes but instead of doing a classic cake, we're going to build the cake based on cornbread. Oh. So my first venture is going to be a chocolate cornbread cake with a, uh, a brown sugar buttercream. I'm pretty excited about that. The testing that is going really well. So oh. <laughs> you're just you're a, you're a witch. <laughs> it's one, awesome. one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's a wizard. Yeah, that's probably better. Uh, but no, this is I'm for. First off, I'm glad that we actually were able to get this going because I've, I've wanted to share your story and I've wanted to share, I've just heard amazing things about you and you're top on my list of places that I want to hit when I hit Austin again. And uh, just, uh, just I've heard great things. So thank you for taking the time and thank you for doing what you're doing and, and your passion, it shows. And people, I think people will get a lot out of this and learn more about you. 
And you're well, I appreciate it. I mean, it, 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 it's super awesome and, and really helpful to spread the word out about their restaurant. And honestly, I, I just I geek out on people that are excited about food. I mean, I can talk food and beer and bourbon for hours That's awesome. uh, you know, with people that are excited about it. So I, I appreciate you know the conversation. It's a lot so, of fun. So I figure I, I, I probably when I arrive, we'll probably be talking a lot. So I'm excited. I'm excited to meet you in person and hang out at your restaurant. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people are. So thank you so much for the time. I have a have a great rest of your week. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin.